They are sworn to serve and protect. But it's more than an oath, it's a commitment. A commitment that starts with 17 weeks at the academy. Welcome to our special report titled 17 Weeks. Over the next half hour, we'll introduce you to the six newest Evansville police officers and their transformation from civilian to cop. Never before has the media been allowed to document their experience through the academy from beginning to end. Eyewitness News is the first. This is the start of Watch. It's a beautiful day. Their lives took them down different lanes, twisting at different turns but they'll eventually cross the same line together. These 15 souls are a composite of what we are, saints among sinners, friends among foes, the most needed and the most unwanted. They separate the prey from the predator, the light from the dark. It is here that over the next 17 weeks, they will become the police. Big day in their lives, but it's also a big day in their lives. This is where the thin blue line begins. On behalf of the 120,000 residents of the city of Evansville, thank you. With right hands raised, swearing before God a promise to uphold. <laughs> On this day, they receive their badges, but over the next 17 weeks, they will have to earn them. William Tyler George. Sarah Gibson. Eric Herman. Amanda Etmeyer. Mike DeBlanc. Jacqueline Smith. Badge numbers 1405. 1406. 1408. 1409. Badge numbers 1410. After being in college and then coming straight from college into this, it's kind of like, okay, <laughs> so I'm ready to hit the road. If they are to enforce the law, they will be expected to know it and follow it. By law, I want you to know the right way from the wrong way. Before spending three straight weeks with noses and books. They've gone over how to identify somebody. The recruits will be shown how confidence breeds cooperation. Tell them you'll call them back. Okay, one second. I'm, no, I, I need you to tell them you'll okay, call them back. Okay, we need to right. talk to you, sir. Yeah, sir, okay. Sure, all right. Hang the phone up. At this point, their belts are a series of empty holsters, no gun, no taser, just a pair of Smith & Wesson handcuffs. Look, if you fail to identify, I can arrest you for that. Okay. Sergeant Lauren Martin will tell you sometimes you don't need any of it. We can teach people how to how to fight and how to shoot and all this, but it's all, you know, we don't want to do that. It's all in de-escalation, talking to people, making a personal connection with them so that they don't look at us like we're robots or something. I'm not, I'm not a bad guy. You guys are acting like I'm some felon or something like that. In this situation, he's the rude guy with the phone. Well, I'm still not sure why you're IDing me. But at any other time, he's Jeff Taylor. My mom calls me Jeffrey field training officer. He's been in their position before. I can barely remember that far back. So I can't, 13 years ago is a long time, but I'm sure I was the same way. It, it, it takes a while to get uh, pretty decent this stuff. Drawing from experience, he provides insight. Officers may drive cars with black, blue, and white, but the job includes a lot of gray. You being confrontational, you have to have a thin line. You, you want to be polite, but at the same time, you have to be confrontational to do this job. I always tell them as we go through the academy, the advice I gave my son before he went to the military is do the right thing at the right time for the right reason, even if there's nobody around watching you, and you'll be okay. It's a three-week program where they're going to uh, work with their pistol, <laughs> shotgun, and a rifle. At Red Brush Rifle Range, the sound of brass and stone meets the smell of gunpowder. But firearms coordinator and lead instructor Chuck Knowles says the group has raw talent and potential. George, you cheated and you still didn't win. How'd I cheat? You had four rounds in there. Four rounds. Did I? <laughs> I've been involved with the academy since 2005, and this is probably one of the best classes we've had. Shooting a gun is far more than hitting the target, Knowles says. They will be responsible for every round fired. They will have to be prepared. They will have to be perfect. No bad habits. Um, I like females better than males because they tend to be better listeners and they don't have a machismo to overcome. Are we dancing or what? Oh, there we go. 
I think our defensive tactics training is second to none. They're more than halfway through, but week 10 of 17. Of course, we're all nervous about it. Oh, I'm not kneeling either. Brings them face to face with their breaking point. That's what our defensive tactics is. There he is, black pants, red shirt. I can't even believe. A little over a week straight of getting it handed to you. I said before we started, this will be like hell week. And it was. We have had a few that uh, whenever we get to like the defensive tactics portion of it, realize that I don't want to be a policeman. What are you going to do? The first day of defensive tactics pits these rookie cops against seasoned fighters. You're going to die today. They have been taught how to defend the public and their fellow officers. Middle of the mat. But it is here. Get on your back. Where they will learn go, okay. how to defend themselves. So I say go. 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 Most importantly, it's about who is still standing. And we're here to keep the community safe and we're here to go home every night to our families. And I mean, I know that, you know, everybody here has the heart to do that. So coming up when 17 weeks continues. You know, the first thing that pops in my mind is my dad and how he did it. Finding perseverance through pain. Sarah Gibson and Mike DeBlanc share their story. Sometimes where you're going is just as important as where you've been. We'll be right back. One of them played semi-professional basketball. Another one was a circuit design specialist for a communications company. Five of the six are Evansville natives, but together they make up the newest class of Evansville police officers. But for two in particular, they're finding purpose through pain. Scribbled on a piece of folded white paper, prominently placed at their assigned seats, you will find their reasons. At the police academy, it's one of their first assignments. God's put this desire in my heart for a reason. If I can change one or two people's lives in my career, at the end of the day, I've done it for the, for the right reasons. It bit them. <laughs> Give me your arm! Hard. <laughs> for the six newest Evansville police officers, the purpose for their pursuit did not let go easy. My dad is William George. My dad was in work for the Sheriff's Department for 28 years. He's the chief of police in Princeton right now. He Not only make a name for myself, but also live up to my father's name. Some were born into it. Others, like Amanda Epmeyer and Mike DeBlanc, were driven to it. Oh, you jerk. Keep going. We got one you more. jerk. We had more people getting in trouble by the law in our family than actually wanting to be the law. In fact, one that literally just got out of prison. I've been there, I've done that, I've seen that. Driver, put both hands outside the vehicle! The purpose of life is a life of purpose. Put your hands in the air! 17 grueling here, weeks begins their careers. You got a gun, gun! Enduring it shows it's more than a calling. Well, pull them up! Blessed to get the call. I wasn't expecting to get a phone call. Smith, I need to talk to you. You know, I really didn't question it. Immediately burst into tears. <laughs> It was emotional for me. Officer Sarah Gibson, 28 years old, mother of one. On the day she received the call, her heart was touched. One second, sorry. <laughs> 22 years after, it was broken. I turned around and went to my mom's work. She saw that I was crying, so she thought something happened. And um, we went to the bathroom and I told her and we both just overwhelmed and joyed and, and um, happy for the moment. Being a middle child, Gibson had to compete for attention. But this daddy's girl always won. Apple in his eye. James Duke Gibson II was more than a dad and more than a cop. He. Three days a year. Is her purpose. I kind of become an introvert. <laughs> I don't really, I prefer to be by myself on those days. February 6th, 1992. The sky fell at 9.48. AM. A C-130 military aircraft left the crater. A rising tide of fire and smoke swallowed the Drury Inn, trapping dozens inside. 18-year veteran officer Duke Gibson went inside. 18 days later, he was gone. Duke Gibson put the lives of strangers above his own. 
and was honored posthumously with the Gold Merit Award. His widow accepted it on his behalf. My mom's my rock. She is physically, mentally, emotionally strong in every aspect, and I strive and hope every day that I can be like her. With the strength of her mother and the bravery of her father, Gibson has found purpose through pain. The way he handled his stress and, and um, went on with things, I, I admired it. I wanted um, nothing more than to be like him. You ready? No. I don't have to be. The physical training requires drive. <sighs> okay, open your eyes, open your eyes. Open your eyes. Oh, shit! Let's go. The defensive tactics requires determination. And the 10 exams in 17 weeks requires diligence. Just spray it on my eyes. Yep, spray your forehead, spray your eyes, spray wherever it hurts. But as far as Mike DeBlanc is concerned, it's terrible. He's just happy to finally be here. I applied for Evansville Police Department alone for 10 straight years. For 10 straight years, he sought these 17 weeks. Drop it in. Each flip of the calendar, a 22-page application, <laughs> physical and written test, plus two board interviews. There was the blind hope and bitter letdown. I asked myself, I was like, what am I going to do if this police department doesn't work out? And I didn't have an answer. Some would have stopped after two times, others after three. But DeBlanc knew he had to keep trying for just one reason. I think if it was just me, I'd probably found something else and been content with. But since, you know, I kind of took it to heart that I'm going to do it not only for me, but for him as well. Private First Class Darren DeBlanc received the Purple Heart on April 12, 2005. It was an IED that sent shrapnel into his arm and leg. Before Darren returned to duty, former Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld honored his sacrifice. But three weeks after this picture was taken, four of the soldiers would be dead. Ready? Hey. Mike was a pallbearer at his brother's funeral. He was actually the first Evansville resident to be killed in action. So, uh, yeah, he was my best friend. And uh, I, I do think that's, and his whole thing was, sorry, he went to the Army and he wanted to come out, get his college and join the Evansville Police Department. And, you know, we talked about it. That's what we wanted to do. And so, as the years went by, after he died, I, I applied, not get on, not get on. And I was like, and like I said, I thought every year, you know, why am I doing this? And I think that's, that's a big reason why I kept doing it. Because he, he would love to. And he couldn't. Losing a loved one is a different kind of pain, sharp as a razor's edge, never to be dulled with time. It's the sting you live with, but never get used to. It can be pinned in a box or pressed in an album. If it doesn't break you, pain can shape you. I think about my dad a lot and what he would think. I try to imagine what, what his words would be, what his excitement would be. Gibson and DeBlanc's losses were different, one while protecting his community, the other while protecting his country. The promise to serve and protect is a testament to how far they've come. What happened afterward is an appreciation for how they got there. At the end of my day, I, uh, I went to visit my dad and um, shared with him my news. First thing I did after I, we got sworn in is I went to the cemetery. Told him we, I did it. <laughs> Granted, I wish, I wish he was here. But that was, I still felt like he was there. Coming up when 17 weeks continues. <laughs> the dangers of the job are real, but the value in what they do is too. That story coming up after the break. Welcome back to 17 Weeks. The headlines come far too often. 
since her first day of training back in mid-July. 38 law enforcement officers have been killed in the line of duty. The risk of the job may be ever present, but their resolve is everlasting. Staring down the iron sights with steel silhouettes staring back. They fired. Two to the body, one to the head. Threat. Whether it's a newly sworn officer or well-decorated veteran, the risk is something they never lose sight of. Do I want something to happen to where, you know, my kids wouldn't have a father? No. But do I know it's a possibility? Yeah. For those walking the thin blue line, danger lurks around every corner. Sometimes it's in plain view, like 14 frantic seconds in September. And staring down the demon, he absolutely was heroic. Body camera videos like this one are a part of the sermon when the instructors preach the dangers of the job. I'm telling you, you will get so sick and tired of hearing me talk about officer safety. I don't care if you screw everything else up out here, do not screw up officer safety. The final call has been answered too many times. With honor, integrity, and distinction, Unit 139 Adam is out of service. Home. According to the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund, 106 officers were killed in the line of duty from November 6, 2013 to November 6, 2014. That's a 25 percent increase over the previous year. 43 officers were killed by a gun in that time period. That's a 65 percent increase from the 26 deaths the year before. Despite these startling statistics, it's not the leading cause of death. We lose more law enforcement officers to traffic collisions than we do felonious assault. From 2004 to 2013, more than 640 law enforcement officers were killed as a result of a traffic-related incident. That exceeds the number of officers shot to death by nearly 100. And just by the sheer number of hours we spend behind the wheel, you know, things can go, things can go bad in a hurry. That's why emergency vehicle operations training is such a critical part of the academy. We want them to keep their head up and look down the road, and that's all part of this, it's just baby steps. We're going to gain some speed through here. We're going to have to slow it down before we make this curve. Turn it. Whether it's behind the wheel or behind the sights, they've chosen a dangerous profession. They know it, and their families know it too. I don't want someone to go knock on my door at three o'clock in the morning and tell my husband I'm sorry. I've given my life to the Lord and it's, when it's time for me to go, it's time for me to go. I want to watch my daughter graduate. My biggest worry of course is her going through what I had to go through. The hazards never waver. The danger never ceases. But they'll tell you this risk is one worth taking. Coming up when 17 weeks continues. The bond that they all had was Incredible. A bond that can never be broken. From the outside, the brotherhood of law enforcement may not always be understood. You cuff on. Good job, bro. Be careful. All right. But you know it when you see it. Our final segment coming up after the break. Welcome back to 17 Weeks. The patches may differ from department to department, the uniforms too. But when a law enforcement officer is lost in the line of duty, there's a reason why so many officers come from so far away to pay their final respects. The one true constant is the bond behind the badge. Things look different from the eyes of a seven-year-old. The world doesn't always make sense. Questions don't always have answers. But in February 1992, the day of her father's funeral, something was crystal clear. The bond that they all had was incredible. 22 years later, it's a bond Sarah Gibson is beginning to see now, a bond of her own. The, the farther in the cabin, academy that we've gotten, the closer we've all gotten. They've got to really want to do this to put up with us for 17 weeks. <laughs> there weren't 15 strangers on that first day. And even if there were, they weren't strangers for long. For some, like Mike DeBlanc and Tyler George, they became friends, best friends. 
recently just found out that my wife's pregnant. So I told him things are going to change. You know, got a little one coming to the family. He's kind of noticing a little bit already. It's just been a blessing. He's like, it's going to stop when we have a guy. I was like, no, it's not going to stop for 18 years. They started their 17 weeks with scars worn on the inside. Inevitably, there will be more in the years to follow. But that doesn't always have to harden them. It's simply part of what makes them human. Stop it! I think I would want people to know just what any police officer would want everybody to know. Like, we are human and we are people just like you. I'd like to treat people the way I'd like to be treated if I got stopped or if I got if I was talked to by the police. They all came from different backgrounds and for different reasons. They pushed each other through PT. 185 picked each other up after DT. <laughs> the bond that Sarah Gibson saw the day her father was laid to rest is the same bond she sees today. I feel like it's already there. <laughs> Let's go! Come on! Come on! Come on! Let's go! Let's go! All the way through! All the way through! Keep it going! Come on! Come on! Come on! July 18th. Yeah! The six officers will graduate tomorrow afternoon at the old National Events Plaza. The ceremony begins at 2 o'clock. And after a nine-month probationary period, they will finally be able to hit the streets, and we wish them the best of luck. We thank you for watching our half-hour special. Make it a great night.